All right, so uh, I just turned on the recording there. Um, so what we'll do is I'll just do kind of a brief, you know, how this kind of game about. Uh, after we're all done, I'll record like a, what they refer to as like a bumper where I'll, I'll say something like, you know, do you want to become a better sports better, but you don't have a computer degree, you don't have a math degree, you feel a little bit overmatched. Well, today, Alan Denkinson and I, you can call him Dink, will talk about blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I'll record that afterwards and then splice it into the beginning. And then I'll have a little bit of a title sequence and then get into the part that I'll be doing shortly here where I introduce you and how this came about. All right, All right I'm just going to to set up my screen here so that I'm looking at the camera as much as possible. One second. You good to start? Good. Okay. So a few days ago, Alan Denkinson, uh, and you can refer to him as Dink. We all refer to him as Dink. Uh, he's a legend in the sports betting space. He's been doing this for decades. Uh, he reached out to me and he said, you know what, Jack? We need to make a video together and we need to talk to all of the sports bettors who might feel like they don't have a computer science degree or a math degree and they want to be a better sports better but they don't know exactly how to go about it without all of this extra computer help uh, and I agree with him I think it's a great idea so joining me today is Dink. Uh, Dink thanks for coming along today uh, nice to see you. My pleasure good to see you too. So you grow your hair I can see that. Huh? Anyway. Well you know, I had and during the pandemic, it kind of grew out a little bit and uh, trimmed it back, and now it's coming out again. I don't know. It's who knows these days, right? They all kind of blend into each other. Uh, but you look good, sir. You, uh, you. you've been keeping yourself uh, occupied these uh, now that we have sports back. Staring at Don Best twelve hours a day, it seems. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll get into how how exactly that can benefit uh, some of these these sports betters. But uh, Dink, let's start out with uh, what our target audience is here today, because I think you made a really good point here on, on what we're trying to get and who we're trying to reach with this. Well, it's for either beginners and people who have a goal to become a professional gambler or just improve their game a little bit. Um, it's not for total beginners, it's for people who can go up another step maybe to a more successful game. And if you ask anybody their goals for gambling, for being a sports better, the first answer would be winning. Um, and the second answer should be improving how my process is of finding good bets. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, I know that when we talked earlier, we were talking a little bit about, uh, you know, what should be the mindset here? You know, in other words, this, this might not be for everybody. There might be some betters out there who enjoy just putting a few dollars every Sunday morning on who they think the hot team is and then watching the games and, and that's it for their sports betting. But what about those if who want to go a little deeper? If you're a small better, there's nothing wrong with betting for entertainment. If the money isn't important to you and you want to bet $50 on the early game and $50 on the late game. And if, if you win one and one or two and oh, bet $100 on the night game and have 12 hours of football um, where you figure to lose maybe $20. Um, it's better than going to a movie. But yeah. there are ways to improve yourself to where you have a better chance of not losing the big and possibly getting the best of it. Yeah, and I think, I think that's a key point. It's do you want to go a little further with this? And so do let's you have talk time to go a little further because a lot of people don't. Right, so let's talk a little bit about that time commitment. Um, what, how much time do you think it would take for someone on a weekly basis to, uh, to step up their game? Depends how sharp they are too, but, um, probably 10 hours of listening, learning, looking at lines, looking at line movements, 
analyzing what you've done in the past and how you where your shortcomings might be and how you might improve on that. Right. So uh, let's break that down a little. So the first part you said there was listening and learning. Um, you know, what are some good ways to go about listening and learning for a new better? Some great podcast that actually not only do people tell you who they like, they'll tell you why they like it and you learn how they think. And a lot of times I go, when I first started listening to people like uh, Eddie Drink Your Milkshake, Rob Pizzola, Spanky, Joey Tunes, talk, on, talk about how their gambling, you know, is formatted and what they do to find the, the team they like. It was like, wow, they, they work so much harder than me at something that I can't do except in maybe hockey. So do I want to, I, I learn how to think and it helps me but it doesn't make me a good handicapper unless I put in more hours and learn the players and learn substitutes and learn the injury, learn the scheduling and learn the strength of schedule that they play and on and on and on and on. There's things to do. But we have been talking about breaking down a game to one side or two. Um, oh, I can get my dog to bark. Um, it, it's okay. It's fine. People, people like dogs. Uh, yeah, yeah well, you know, we'll, we'll kind of we'll kind of edit really that important. part out there with the, uh, the barking. Um, okay, one yeah, second, let me just place. close my office door here once she's out okay. of the room. Okay. Cool. Okay, so that'll that'll be a little easier. Um, I'm gonna we'll, we'll cut that one down a little bit to sure. uh, it's talking about you know the guys you mentioned and how they do their process and and that sort of thing. Um, if there's more you want to say on that, go ahead and I'll just find a way to kind of edit it all together. Um, no, I think we're good. Okay. Um, so now when sports bettors get involved and, and they start to listen and learn, uh, the next step there would be that they need to find a way to kind of uh, harness what they're actually looking to do with sports betting. and. I find a lot of sports bettors that approach me, they want to do it all. They want to, they want to handicap every sport. They want to get into uh, every sport, and especially the sport that's currently playing. They don't want to think about a sport that's still six months off. And what would you say to people that, that have that approach of wanting to do it all at once? Can that be done with 10 hours a week of, of work? Jack of all trades, masters of none. Um, I would concentrate my 10 hours on one sport. For me, it's baseball and hockey, and until this year, the pandemic, this is the first time they really overlapped by more than a month. Um, and my life has always been concentrating on one sport and totally ignoring the other because it didn't exist at the time. This year, after doing nothing for three months, they both started on the same day. And yeah. I had to decide on how to approach them after a break of three months that was unscheduled, baseball had started spring training and stopped, and hockey got through 85% of the season and just called it a day and we're going to do playoffs, a different format. So everything became new and a learning process, and both of them didn't have more than two months left when they started. So I, I did both, but I found it a little burdensome because, I mean, Baseball is one of those sports you learn as the season progresses, and two months of the baseball season is about all the data you need for the next three months. And this year, two months of the baseball season is the end of the season. So um, I concentrate a little bit more on hockey, which is a sport I enjoy better and tend to do better in and bet more on. Um, but I still have baseball in the back of my mind because the hockey schedule is just playoffs, and there were games with three games for the buy teams and then you know that weren't that important and I didn't know how they would take approach them and I didn't know what I'd get back from the teams that had missed three months because I never care about what teams did in October and November when I'm handicapping February hockey it's more of a in the now sport than other sports so I had no in the now background because these teams all had three months off and some of them came back better than they played before and like a team like the Blues came back worse than they played before, and it took a little while to figure out that the Blues aren't good anymore, and Dallas is really good, and, and Colorado's really injured, and how much those injuries will affect them and change the way they play the game. 
it was a really interesting time because you can be ahead of the game, but you had to learn fast. It's not yeah, I, I can relate to that. I do basketball and baseball, and they rarely overlap. And this year it was uh, once, you know, we had sports back, man, I was, uh, I was right back into it all day, every day. Uh, you know, my video content kind of took a back seat because I had just had so much sports to keep up with each day in my handicapping as well as uh, line shopping and injury news and things like that. So let's get a little bit into that. So there's a lot of betters that um, they probably don't have the ability to handicap, but they do have the ability to source out some knowledge, right? And, and what would you say to them that, that want to go ahead and find the knowledge that's out there and maybe that isn't factored into the line yet. How do they go about that? What are some of the best resources for that? Twitter, um, the bloggers sometimes give you stuff before the major news comes out. If you want to sit and look at all your bloggers, um, watch TV, listen to podcasts of people who talk about injuries and the effect of injuries. Um, you learn, uh, Rob Pizzola does one on Sunday, which is a little late for the games that are starting in an hour, but you learn his process, so the next week you can start doing what he does. Um, you need to know the players, their values, the backups, their values, how the injury is. You need to know a left tackle is a little bit more important than a right tackle. I don't handicap football, but I, I've just gained, gained that knowledge by listening to podcasts of people who do. The backside of the quarterback, right? That's what the, the left tackle has to protect the, the blind spot. So the, and the center is very important. We all know the quarterback's important. We all know if, uh, if Mahomes is out, that's worth more points than if Denard is out. You know, and, and I don't do football, but I ca I mean I I casually <laughs> I casually make three or four bets Sunday night for the week before, and then see you know keep an eye on injuries, but I do follow moves, so I'm always watching a move and trying to get a stale line from somewhere. It's another thing I think everybody should have at least two apps. Hopefully right. More than right. Of us, comparing lines and to your 50% handicapper by chopping numbers, you become a 51%, maybe a 51.5% handicapper, and you've cut the big in half of what you normally need to win. Right. I, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, line shopping is huge. Being able to find just a, you know, a half point here or, a, you know, half juice at another shop is, is huge. Uh, so we're mentioning a lot about shopping lines. And uh, you mentioned earlier uh, staring at the Don Best screen. Uh, we both use Don Best. We both pay through the nose for Don Best. But what are some ways that a more recreational better who doesn't have $500 a month to spend on Don Best, what are some of the well, ways they can Best, use lines? Um, non-premium account. I don't know if it's a basic account, which is only a hundred and something dollars a month. And it's a little bit delayed, but not very much delayed. And depends on who your outs are. Um, you can chart, you can try the refresh all the time if you have a, a sharp out but it's not so bad to get that $110. I think $110 a month, if you're $100 better, will definitely pay for itself so you know, because they do put up injuries that you might not be aware of, and then you you, you don't make that bet. Like, oh, I didn't know he was out. I would never have bet that. I didn't know the weather was really going to be cold and windy. I would never have bet over. Those things save you money. And Of course, if you're a $10 better, recreational better, $100 is kind of a big cost. But it's true. You know, if you're a recreational manager and you want to stay there, that's fine. That, that, I want to make sure people watching this video don't don't bet more because I'm putting down a recreational matter. That's entertainment. And if you're uh, if you don't have any of those evil habits that we always talk about, like don't chase and bankroll management and things like that, being a recreational man is great. It's fun. It's it's like we all kind of start that way. I don't think anybody goes into step three. It always starts with step one. And you learn the next 2,000 steps. Right. I, th I think that's great advice. There's nothing wrong with being a recreational better. 
there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, this just being a little bit of a side hustle. I mean, even if you're approaching it and you're only expecting to make $20 a week at this and you have a day job and you have other life, this can be a little bit of escape for you. This can be, you know, I just kind of keep up with these lines and I keep up with uh, some basic handicapping so that uh, every Sunday or, you know, every game day, uh, I just have a little bit of sweat in the action as I watch the games. I'm going to be watching the games anyway. So I, I Dink, I think that's a great point. Uh, you know, there's, there's no bankroll shaming going on here. There's, it's not like everyone has to be higher and higher and reach the next level. Uh, you know, you can, you can be fine if you're reaching a, a personal level of satisfaction in how you approach sports betting recreationally or, you know, otherwise. Maybe you're a Raider fan, but you, the game, the Thursday night game is Miami against Jacksonville and you want to watch that game, but you don't really want to watch it without a bet on it. So how small can you bet that it actually matters? If you're betting $3, it might not matter and give you a little kick, but if you're betting $20, it might matter to you. You might want your bet to win. And you, and you want to be right about what you do instead of you're not playing this game, but you've chosen your warriors and you want your warriors to win you the bet. Um, so there's some satisfaction of I was right. And for example, when the Niners played the Rams yesterday, if you bet the winner in that game, you were very satisfied that you picked the winner. And if you bet the loser in that game, you were like, oh my God, I had the wrong side. They were favored by three and they lost by 20 and, you know, whatever. Uh, and, you know, you want to be better. Everybody wants to have their opinion of the Warriors they chosen to be correct because you kind of feel, you did it. You picked the right team. They didn't do this. You did it by picking them. They were your representatives. I played basketball till I was 60, and I wanted to win every game I played. When I bet basketball, I want to win every bet I make. I know that's an unrealistic goal. Both of them are unrealistic goals, but I certainly want to win more than I lose playing the game or choosing my team. Yeah. So now we have, a, we have a recreational better or somebody that's aspiring to be better, and we've told them, uh, listen to some podcasts, uh, spend time learning, uh, try to follow some key people on Twitter to get injury news. What about when they see a line moving? What's the best way to approach that? Um, do you have any advice for people? It's commonly called chasing steam, but what is your advice towards uh, people that are looking at line moves? I chase steam in football and college football and college basketball. Three, three very intimidating games to learn when you're doing other sports. So I have no, I don't want to know. I mean, um, a girl named Pamela Maldonado said that picking Lawrence for the MVP is a lock this year. I hate the word lock, but she uses the word lock. So I kind of criticized her because I really like her. She's dedicated to picking winners for people and proud of herself. And it's nice to see a girl in, in the betting world, the sports betting world, you rarely see one who's prepared to talk about yards per play and, and third down conversions. And she's cool like that, but she used the word lock, which drove me crazy. And I told her, I don't know what a lock is, but to me in the top world, a lock means it's a hundred percent winner. And Lawrence or MVP can't be a hundred percent winner because he can come down with COVID or get injured. And I assumed he was somebody on Clemson and he was, turned out to be the quarterback. That would have been my guess, but I hate that word lock. It, it's, I don't even know how we got on the tangent of this, but it, it's, um, I, you know, it's, it's kind of my, the one thing I'll mention about touts is that you're increasing your big if you're paying for picks. So you have to now win 57% of your games instead of 50 and this is hard. And they probably don't know that much more than you. And they probably are pretty much 50-50 handicappers. There are some good ones. If you go to listen to people, there are better people out there who don't charge than who do in the most cases. But if you find one who can present himself well and go, this is an educated pick, let me send them a few dollars, that's okay. But most of them will just tell you, they went eight and zero, or they went seven and three this week, and only talk about even if they're honest, which I'd say the majority, it's now fifty fifty because if people want to see records. They're smart enough to know that Vegas State didn't really go seventy three and zero, 
this baseball season unless there was a little catch to it, like he was, you know, having five team increased parlays. Um, you know, a big favorite, so you'd win one unit or you'd lose your house, and you can possibly go 73 and 0 and not lose your house. But it has to make sense. Well, everything you learn about this business has to make sense. Like, and that's one of the tricks of listening to people on their podcast or reading a book. I'm an avid devotee of Matt Davidow and his book, The Logic of Sports Betting. It's not made for the genius. It's not made for the beginner. It's made for those in between. And I learned a bunch from it. Um, and I knew a bunch of things that were in the book. So I would justify my, this will help a lot of people get closer to my level, which is, you know, a guy who's my basic, my basic advantage is I'm experienced in this business. I made enough contacts that I get enough. I have like 20 places to choose from and 12 of them are credit places. So that's going to take a while. And that's, you know, that's an advantage I have that the people listening to the video don't have, but to start with two, start with three outs, post up what you need to post up and then compare their lines. You might have one that's slow. You'll find out like every time out A and out and out B move a point on a game, out C didn't move it. And those games tend to win more than 53% of the time, you know, because you're looking at the records and the, the lines continue to go to that number or, or stay at that number and you have a good number from out C. One of the things I do is in football is I hope to get one and a half points better in most of or all my bets. It's a hard thing to do. Once in a while, there'll be an injury against me. I'll have to buy back and pay the juice. And that's okay. Because I know if a bookmaker is dealing five and a half on a game on Sunday, and I call up and I say, oh, what's the line? Alabama's five and a half against Ohio State. And I go, oh, can I leave four? He will go, are you out of your mind? You're not going to leave four. The line's five and a half. And that's because I would have the advantage if, I, if he would let me lay four. Uh, and I already have that bet minus four, so I don't need to call up and ask for it. I become the bookmaker, and he becomes my customer because now I'm the favorite to win in the long run. You can't do it on every game. In some games, you get wrong. In some games, you bet on something that has very little value or no value at all. But in the long run, it's a big betting menu. And I, I told somebody that I bet a little more than half the card, including totals and sides. And the response was, oh, you should quit. You can't do that. You have to be more selective, take a break and come back and bet three games or something. And I'm going, no, no, you don't understand. I have the advantage of all these bets. And I couldn't explain to that person that I wasn't handicapping to get that advantage, that I didn't like under, but I laid under 48 and now the line's 46 because of an injury, or because of weather, or because the line was too high in the first place. So I'm betting a lot of things on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday for the weekend. I bet games on Saturday. I rarely bet games on Sunday. It works for me. My object in football and college basketball and college football and a little bit on the NFL is to just beat the number. My object in the sports I handicap is a combination of beating the closing line and picking the winner. So, so that was a lot of that was a lot of good info there. Dink, and uh, I want to go back and touch on a couple key points there. Uh, when you said you want to try to get a, a point and a half better, uh, you know, obviously certain certain points are worth more than others, and this varies on by sport. This varies uh, spreads and totals. It, you know, it's it's one of the key questions that I get a lot of people ask me is, you know, what is a half point worth on a total in the NBA? What is a half point worth? on the, the side in an NFL game. Uh, and typically, I don't like to spoon feed people, so I'm not gonna just send them a chart. However, I say to them, you know, this is a puzzle that's already been solved. And, you know, Google is your friend, go out and try to Google that information and then come back to me if you still can't find it. And I'll, you know, I'll give you a link to wherever, you know, I've seen it published. Um, you know, and- Can I ask you something? Do people come back or is Google sufficient for most? More than more often than not, people are come back just to say thank you. I was able to find this link. Is this is this reliable? And more often than not, it is reliable because they all come back with the same link. It's the same one that if you were to type that question into Google, it's it's that 
you know, the top choice. Um, but I think that's a key point to make to people is it's far better to learn something and, and get that knowledge than it is for somebody to spoon feed you that knowledge, right? I mean, it, and it's kind of the reason I do a lot what I do on this channel is I don't want to spoon feed people the, the knowledge and definitely not the picks. Uh, I want to kind of encourage them to say, you know, learn it yourself. Here's, here's your little boost uh, to get to that next level. And I think, you know, myself, that's, that would be more enjoyable to me. You know, if I could solve the puzzle rather than have somebody solve the puzzle for me, um, it just makes it far more enjoyable to myself. Yeah, thinking is good. <laughs> thinking is always good. <laughs> thinking is always good. The, the easy way out is not to think and to listen to somebody blindly. Um, but if you're going to listen to somebody, make sure that you thought out his process and go, this makes sense. This is well thought out. He put in a lot of work. Wow, he's giving me this work for free. Eventually, I'm not going to be able to get this work for free. So let me learn how to think like him and then let him justify my thought process by listening to him if, to see if he bet this, comes up with the same side I do. And eventually, I can lead him out of the equation and I know I'm going to think like him. I, I totally agree with that. You know, one of the things that we see right now, and we're, when we're recording this, we're in the middle of the NFL season, and uh, the NFL is a temptation to everybody. Everybody likes to bet the NFL. And the NFL is one of the hardest sports to win against. However, the NFL also gives the better a lot of temptations, a lot of things about it that uh, recreational bettors just kind of tend to gravitate towards. For instance, the games, a large number of the games are played at the same time. And so people tend to want to look at parlays. And when they look at parlays in the NFL, they also look at teasers. And teasers are very popular with both sharps and recreational bettors. But there's a, there's a divide there, right? There's, there's, you know, the sharp ones play a certain subset of teasers and the recreational bettors tease, you know, totals and things like that. So do you want to take a few minutes and talk about kind of the temptations of NFL betting, the do's and don'ts, the ups and downs, uh, you know, some of the, the things that recreational bettors might be able to latch on to. If you're betting five team parlays instead of betting five straight bets, I only recommend that if you're a pure recreational better, it's not the best way to try to win money. Um, they charge you more for parlays. You don't get exactly what you get if you bet a game on Saturday, took back all the money when you won and bet in a game on Sunday. You're paying a tax. They give you 13 to 5. It's less than you would do it if you do it the old-fashioned way. And why people think that big money line parlays is a way around betting the money line itself, it's not. It's the same thing. You lay 10 to 1 on a game for $100 and then bet $110 on another game laying 8 to 1. It doesn't matter if you do it at the same time or if you do it day by day or week by week. And it's it's just uh, it's a mental edge. In fact, in my day, and I don't think they do this anymore, is you couldn't parlay dogs in baseball. Because baseball, they give you true value because they, it's a, they give you a number and what you get back goes on the next number. A bookmaker isn't charging you that 13 to 5 like in football and basketball. So there was a lot of bookmakers who, didn't want, who wanted to book the favorites money line parlays but didn't want to book the dog money line parlays. And mm -hmm. I, I was a bookmaker before I was a better. I was a bookmaker for 15 years and a better for 172 more years after that. But um, I learned a lot from a bookmaking standpoint because at the beginning, I booked all recreational betters. And then all of a sudden, I got a bunch of very, very prominent and successful wise guys, the computers, the coaches, and, and they. I kicked my tush, and um, eventually I learned how they came about to kick my tush because they were kind of generous to me because I stuck with them and didn't throw them out and actually pay them when they took all my money and made me end up going to loan sharks for a little while until I learned how to book wise guys, which is another subject to talk about. But yeah. Yeah. it was an interesting time, and it made me a better better when I became ready to bat. I want to be like, Stevie Z, I want to be like uh, Danny Kramer, the Koshers. Um, 
they kind of showed me a, the way. And, and that was at a time before Don Best, so everybody was getting rundowns. So it was a whole different world. You, you didn't know anybody else's line. You called up and the clerk would read you the numbers in a certain order and you would write them down and go, oh, at first I got a lot of business in some of the things I do, did, but then people realized my line ended up being closer to the closing line than the lines that most bookmakers had because I was booking all the sharks and I was booking them first. And that was my benefit is that my line got adjusted before other lines and people getting the rundowns client were giving me plays that they ended up going, all oh, these plays have no value, that big guy has a sharp line. Then they started calling me for a line service, which I made them and I said, you have to give me a nickel play. All right, I'm not giving you more than one run down a night. So that was the end of how that stopped that from just using me to learn what the sharp lines were. It was such a different time. I don't think I can be a good bookmaker anymore. I think it's really hard. Yeah. You know? And I understand why people throw out sharps, um, except for the fact that it just makes the next guy in line the sharp unless they want to move by air. And if they're moving by air, why are they going to another country to run a business and not take bets? It's hard to get squares. It's, you know, you just, I can't open up in Costa Rica tonight and get, you know, 500 you know, recreational bettors. They already have a bookmaker. They probably don't look, aren't looking for another. I don't know how I would pay them anyway. It's a lot of process now. And, it's a whole different world now. I, I went to look like 15 years ago. I couldn't, I couldn't fathom going there anymore. So I quit. I got a felony and I quit and I turned to Benny. Um, and, and, and that's great. Uh, I'm going to probably splice that around a little bit because I do want to kind of. I saw when I said felony, your eyes lit up. So I guess. Well, I, you know, I, we'll just, we'll make it, we'll make it a little bit more. But uh, what I kind of want to do with that, though, is I was sort of wanted to get into what you were talking about with teasers earlier as well. So, oh, yeah, I, I muffed that up. Yeah, so we, we, we talked about part. If you want, we can kind of put that okay. in earlier, and then we can talk about parlays and teasers right now. Or if you want to just talk, talk to teasers. You. It's, all. it's your show. I don't mind. You do what's best for the video. I let you make those decisions. Um, okay. Well, I'll probably leave most of that in, and then I'll come back to it, and I'll say something like this. Um, Okay, so that's parlays, but what about what about teasers as well, Dink? How are how are recreational betters should they approach uh, teasers in the NFL, which are a very popular betting choice? Okay, there's something called the Wong teasers. That's the clear right way to do teasers. Don't I don't I don't care if you don't like the team you're getting. If you can cross three and seven with moving six points and laying a dollar ten, you're the bookmaker. He's the square. Uh, $1.20 probably is a break-even point. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah uh, you know, it's really a, a sliding scale. In fact, I was kind of thinking of doing a, a, a video on this topic. Uh, you know, not only the minus 110, but if you can go three-team and get plus 160 or better, that's like getting minus 110. If you can get plus 180, which actually still exists in some places, uh, that's like getting even money two-team teasers, which were the bee's knees back in the day, right? Yeah. And again, you have to, you know, make sure you're going through three and seven. I, I, I had a friend call me yesterday. He said, I had a best to live in a teaser. I took plus two and everybody else would have only given me plus one. And I go, no, you didn't have the best of it with that team. Yeah. You're leaving yourself, you're, you're buying the six points through terrible numbers. So one of the things that teasers allow us is, and, and parlays don't is your ability to kind of bail out, right? Uh, do you want to want to speak a little bit more to that? I mean, if your first side wins, you what you can do with your second side? Right. Yeah, I guess if you have a game that's going from two and a half and you go to eight and a half and that's your game that's open because you've already won the first part, you can lay the two and a half and create a minus two and a half plus eight and a half middle. Um, I don't do that. I mean, the minus two and a half is the square is there. If I was booking, I'd be using two and a half. So I would let people lay me the two and a half why am I laying the two and a half to make a really good bet into a not so great middle because I'm not getting the best of both sides? That's my theory of that. I don't know if you agree or disagree. No, I, I agree with that. You know, anytime that you're using a positive EV bet and then a slightly negative EV bet to offset it, 
there is a you know slight decrease in your expected value just based on that math right there um, it'll never equal a a better wager and you, you reduce your variance and and for a lot of people they like that um, but you know the point always remains if if you're betting a parlay or a teaser or something where uh, you know you're two legs in out of three and you're really sweating because you you know if you really need to win it you probably bet too much in the first place right. uh, you, you know you should have bet a two-team teaser or two-team parlay uh, if you're if you're sweating out that third leg as as if it's like do or die money I get a lot of those questions sometimes I, I just hit three games and it's the night game and my parlay and I'm up a thousand dollars and now I have to go two thousand or nothing if I bet a thousand on the other side, I can lock in a thousand. And I go, if you bet a three team parlay, you could have locked in a thousand on you. I have to make a bet that's not what you want against what your pick is just to get out of the bet that you shouldn't have bet in the first place. If you wanted to get out of the bet, if you got this far, um, right. it's not a total anymore. It's just a bet. You, you know, you, lay, you have the Colts minus seven, but now you're going to have to take the Bengals plus seven to get out of your parlay. Why did you do the parlay in your first place? You, just, you know, you're just laying juice on that minus seven that you didn't have to lay, that plus seven that you didn't have to lay to buy out. It, it's up to you. And maybe you don't like that bet anymore. Maybe you've learned something about the game that you don't like that bet. So I, I get a lot of hedging questions. Should I hedge this? Should I hedge that? And I go, it's up to you. It's a personal decision. If it's like, it's like a hundred to one on a baseball team winning their division and they're playing in a playoff game for it. Yeah. You might want to hedge because now you have 50 to one on one side and, and you care about on the other. You still have that 50 to one side. Um, it depends on the money, how much money you have, how much money it means to you and you know, how bad you feel if you lose that, that last game of your hundred to one shot. Right. Awesome. I always talk, I always talk about that. There's two bankrolls that you have as a, a better you have a monetary bankroll and we can all figure out what your monetary bankroll is that's the amount of money you have to risk at this and and if you were to lose it you would be done um and you also have an emotional bankroll and you have uh your emotional bankroll is the amount of money you're willing to lose before it drives you a little bit bonkers you know uh you know i know plenty of people that have had huge bankrolls but they get down one third of it and they're they're crying in their beer they just can't handle it they you know they they uh they just don't want to go on with sports betting or you know in any other kind of pursuit of of betting and in that case your your emotional bankroll was much lower than you uh admitted to um and it, and you know it, it was it didn't match your monetary bankroll um and you know that kind of leads us into another part of our conversation here so when we're recording this, uh, and you know, the nice part about being on YouTube is these will live on forever, uh, or basically forever. I don't know. So maybe somebody's watching this years from now, and they don't realize, uh, you know, what exactly we kind of went through in 2020, the ups and the downs. And uh, I know it had an effect on you, Dink. It had an effect on me, everyone. Um, and we should probably talk a little bit about what some of the mental and psychological effects are of not only sports betting, uh, but also, you know, enduring the pandemic and, you know, getting to do things. I know, Dink, from having uh, known you for a while and having followed you on Twitter, you are a big fan of uh, professional wrestling and not just the, the big WWE, you know, Royal Rumble type of productions, uh, but I guess it would be called amateur professional wrestling, more no, localized. It's independent. Independent, okay. Uh, and I know that's a that's a huge kind of distraction for you. Uh, you're also a huge fan of rock concerts. Uh, how, how many concerts? Do you have any idea how many concerts you've been to, Dink? Oof, um, no, <laughs> I don't think because I've been going since I was a kid. So um, over a thousand for sure. I, I yeah, know, I've maybe approaching yeah. two thousand. I'm not sure because I, I mean, mean I'll go see a band five nights in a row if they're playing close by if I like the band. I'm, I'm one of those repeating guys. If I like a food, I don't, I usually go to a restaurant, I'm not going to try another food. My ex-wife would never eat the same food twice. And I go, and she would go, oh, I, I don't really like this. I'm going to eat some of yours. 
And I go, why don't you order what you love? You know, you love broccoli rod, just get the broccoli rod. It's not like you have it seven days a week. I can eat the same food seven days a week. It makes me happy all the time. And you go back to the like the like the days of CBGB, right? In in New York City. Oh, there we go. I I had no idea. You didn't know that. And I was like, oh, this will be a cool shirt to wear. And I go, ah, nobody can see it because I have such a big head that it takes up the whole. Um. But talk about talk about so how those distractions and those other things in your life kind of complement and uh, balance this, you know, the sports betting side, this, you know, the the side that can be a little bit tough, uh, mental drain, and and how you've dealt with it over over the past year. The pandemic's been hard for me. It's uh, it, I, there are no concerts. There are wrestling videos that I'm watching and wrestling podcasts that I listen to, but you can't go there. There's no shows. To, couple of outdoor shows in Florida and Jacksonville now, but I'm not uh, getting on a plane for five hours wearing a mask and you know, coming back for five hours wearing a mask to go to a two and a half hour show. It's a, it's a lot of work and still I'm you know, putting yourself in a spot where you might be somewhere you shouldn't be, even though know, that's an outdoor show. The indoor show that I just had, and now we're getting a little detailed, um, one of the wrestlers had COVID and now a bunch of the wrestlers have COVID, and I think the audience was safe because they were very spread out and far away from the ring. Um, but you know, that's that's sad that that didn't work out because it would have been the first step of running good independent shows safely, and they didn't test. You know, they kind of because testing is expensive, and these shows don't make a lot of money. I I run about twenty shows that I promote myself, and. I'm 0 for 20 and making money. I just really enjoy doing it. It's not, this is about, the game. the sports betting is about me so I can do things I enjoy that isn't, you know, going to shows, running wrestling shows, going to concerts. Everything's been taken away from me. So the last four months, the end of July to now, three and a half months, has been all about them. And it's wearing me down where, I'm risk averse, especially now, because I have no idea what the future is going to hold. Um, so it just wears me down. I finally had a really bad week, and it was yesterday. Um, you know, it's like, all right, I'm going to bet a little less this week, just so I don't, you know, compound parlay two bad weeks in a row and just feel like, why am I doing this? Uh, is it just because I'm trying to kill time? And I haven't watched a lot of Netflix shows. I'm saving them for when um, baseball ends and football. And I don't care about college basketball. I don't know if I'm going to watch the screen for that. There are just way too many head fakes, which is a whole other subject. Um, so, you know, the, you need diversions to make yourself a better gambler. You can work every day, but if there's a couple of shows you want to see or uh, going to a show in L.A. or a wrestling show, I'll work a couple hours in the morning, so I'm still staying aware of the moves of what's going on in the gambling world. And, you know, I, it's hard for me to miss a day because I think that the continuation is, is pretty important, in, especially if you're handicapped. Why did this land move here? Why, why did the, you know, oh, I didn't know this guy didn't play because I was at a show, but now I realize now I'm looking at a box score and, and going, you know, Bellinger didn't play. That's more relevant last year, but it might be relevant to come this World Series because he subboxed his shoulder in the eighth inning. I wonder if he, he's going to play. But that's an example of just staying up to date so you don't make mistakes. Just a little bit of time every day. For me, it's a little bit of time, just three hours, because I don't have another job. A lot of people in this video have 40 hours against you because that's your job every day. This is to help you a little bit more by listening to this video and finding out some real tricks of the trade. And, and a lot of don'ts, don't do this, don't do that. Those are the things we can eliminate. That's important to eliminate the don'ts. Yeah, uh, I, think that, I think that's very key. Um, there's probably more bad habits than good habits that you can develop as you get deeper into sports betting. You know, I've always said that uh, when you try something new, 
The worst thing that can happen is that you lose. However, the second worst thing that can happen is you win. And a lot of people get false hope when they win at something. You know, they go, oh, I'm going to try this, you know, parlaying all these big money lines together. And, oh, look, they all won and I made a profit and I'm going to do this every week now uh, because I won. Therefore, I proved my theory in, in one, one simple wager. Um, there is. There's so many more bad habits than good habits that can develop. Uh, one last thing we want to talk about, though, is uh, record keeping. So, you know, we wanted to kind of create this video. And we wanted to be people that don't have, uh, you know, computer science or computer background or anything like that. Um, and, well, what do they do about record keeping? Uh, how, how should they approach record keeping? Um, what you want to learn from record keeping is your strengths and your weaknesses, but it takes a little bit of uh, sample space before you can make that judgment. Um, a lot of beginners do good in totals, and they have become like, I'm only going to do totals. I'm great at totals. I'm 30 and 17 in my first 47 bets. Leave your ego at the door before you decide you're really good at something, because you're going to have a bad streak. Even if you're really good at something, you're going to have a bad streak. Don't blame your losses on luck and your wins on skill. That's the, that's the law of football. There's always something that happens that um, makes you feel that you're unlucky if you lost. If only this didn't happen. If only it didn't fumble. The referee called pass interference. Or didn't call pass interference. Or, but if yeah. you win, you never question why you won. You never go, oh, my God, I was lucky. Unless you hit a Hail Mary at the buzzer or something. You just think you're smart. So everybody is going into next week's attitude thinking they're either smart or unlucky. And they'll keep that attitude a lot. Let the record company, let the record keeping show if you're smart or unlucky, but you have a whole season, maybe two seasons before you can make conclusions. If you're running bad at something, you might start questioning that more than if you're running good on something. Um, you know, maybe I shouldn't be betting, you know, Russian hockey. I don't know, whatever you think you're good at that doesn't, there's so many options of a betting market now. Um, I don't play niche sports, and, and I know you do, and I think, or, or derivative sports, I don't do that much. Um, in baseball, I will take the option of the first five innings or the, the whole game very seriously because you want to eliminate your bullpen play or add the bullpen play to your bet. Sometimes they're not, sometimes the bookmakers do make a mistake in, in aligning them the same when they're obviously not the same. That's one trick we'll talk about. Like if you're a baseball handicapper, know the bullpen usage of your team, know who's available and not. Again, in the pandemic, it's different. They play. You saw that um, last night was the finals of the Dodger um, Dodger Braves series, and, and the, every team has to use like five or six pitchers because they've been playing seven games and seven nights, and the bullpen can't go, the starters can't go. Uh, it becomes a bit of a crapshoot. Um, those aren't the usual circumstances. Usually, if your ace bullpen pitchers pitch the first, the last two games, he's not going to pitch the third in, in a normal season. The pandemic has so many different rules to it. It's, it's, it becomes a major part of your hand. As in your in your opinion, Dink, um, if you were 25 years old and you're just getting started into sports betting, uh, is, is it going to be better than you had it when you started or is it going to be worse? You know, we're, we're kind of standing on this precipice of all this legalized sports betting across most of the United States. Is it a, is it a good thing or is the, are the golden days of sports betting already behind us? Golden ages of sports betting are behind us. It's still a good thing, but your competition is much, much harder. And probably a lot of people in when, when the economy crashed who were very smart and very educated became uh, sports bettors. They turned from the stock market to sports betting. And they really increased the, their edges became your disadvantage. And they were taking all the good bets. Um, when I started, I was a college graduate, and I started betting before I became a bookmaker for a couple of years. I was one of the smartest people in the business. It seemed like everybody else was totally social. And, and I was like, 
I remember a bookmaker said after the first week, you can't bet with me anymore. And I said, why? I, I, you know, I went like four and two or something, nothing. The first week, he said, oh, you bet underdogs. I don't want to bet with you. You know, So he had the line higher than everybody else because he didn't want, because everybody bet in favor. So my edge, when I first started betting in uh, 1970, was that I bet underdogs. And that was good enough to have two points of advantage in a lot of your bets. Um, a lot of people use the newspaper line. And I was had access to a sharp bookmaker, even at a young age. That was an incredible edge. Sometimes the newspapers would misprint a hockey game to one, one and a half the wrong side, and I would have a two, two and a half goal advantage if I just picked the right side. And it was pretty easy to do. I remember when I first became a bookmaker, you know, little customers would go, can I use the daily news line? I don't know, you have to use the line I give you. <laughs> I this game six, so you have a three. I go, well, three is the number. You can wait three, <laughs> and then you can get three points better than the daily news. But, um, you know, so yeah, it's really different now. It's, it's an, I listen to people like yourself and Spanky, Joey Tunes, and Eddie Drink Your Milkshake, and Rob Pizzola, and I'm forgetting people who want to make a cook. I'm forgetting people who are really sharp in their support, and I go, it's going to take me another five years to be that. I don't really have another five years to improve. I have to take my niches and, you know, stick with hockey for sure, because only Rob does hockey. Um, you know, the advantages are so hard to find, but I do have the experience factor, and I do have the connections factor, and that's my edge. Certainly, I'm not as smart as you or as smart as people who can actually compute. Well, yeah, I have a three-point edge in betting this game and be accurate. Anybody can come up with a model that means nothing. You know, on Mondays, bet the home favorites, and on Tuesdays, but you know, that's a model, but it's a not model. And, and you know, I think everybody who has models, I'm sure yourself. Your first model is so out of date compared to your new models. Uh, you, you're constantly tinkering with things as things as the variables change. So, even if you're a modeler, don't don't let that word intimidate you. If you can't possibly do a model, it, it, a, a lot of people think they have models that are complete nonsense. And you know, it's a start, and maybe you'll you'll lose money and start figuring out how to make your model better. But there's only one or two people I know who can, can produce winning models early, and they're all exceptionally bright or lying. But I think yeah, I, I think a lot of people use numbers as a crutch. You know, they say, "Oh, look, this supports my narrative that I was trying to fit into my model in the first place." So therefore, it's quantitative. It, you know, it's sacrosanct, and we're going to play it. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people fall into that that trap. And sometimes it's good to try to approach it without computer help and try to look at this as if it was, uh, you know, a puzzle, a logic puzzle that you're that you're figuring out rather than a, you know, a number uh, equation that you, you've put it up against. Or a combination of both. Yes, and that is that is the more the the best path of action is is when the numbers and, and, and your qualitative analysis can come together and support each other. Um, that's a good point. Uh, all right, so Dink, any other advice or any other closing parting advice you would have to um, betters out there that you know, hopefully have made it this far in this video? Uh, they're a little bit more excited now that they have uh, kind of this pathway that it doesn't involve computer science and doesn't involve heavy math. Um, you know, any other closing tips for them? Make sure that you think your handicapping is fun. The, the edge of this whole business is you can do well and have fun that a lot of people can't have that fun at their job. They're not happy. I lived in New York taking the subway in. I worked for like six months out of college and I go, I'm miserable. I'm going to try something with sports. And we started with harness racing and involved to sports betting for a little while and then booking, you know, booking baby customers and growing gradually through it to be kind of a big bookmaker 
and then you know the same process with betting i had to start all over um don't bet too much don't chase your losses have a, a, a plan stick to the plan don't change your plan if you're going good increase your bankroll a little just a little if you're going bad decrease your bankroll a little just a little um keep going it's it's a it's a, don't get even for the week don't get even for the day don't get even for the month every day you're even you wake up even take the new day as like like you already paid off the losses for tuesday and wednesday and this is thursday now you're starting even even though on the paper on the books you're down 1500 or whatever um don't don't chase don't round off your numbers i'm i'm up 13 1372 dollars so i'm going to bet 372 on a game today if i lose i'll round it off to a thousand even though you're a hundred dollar better or 150 dollar better yeah don't don't and leave your ego at the door that's really important don't think you're that good don't think your losses are unlucky, so you're due to win now and bet more. Um, I know so many people on Sunday who bet higher when they're stuck for the week and almost don't bet anything when they're up for the week because they want to freeze in the eyes. It's, each bet matters separately. You know, it, it's, it's, there's so many bad habits you can get into, and there are books about avoiding them. There are podcasts about avoiding them. Really, sound easy and then you start losing and then you start chasing and get upset and you start losing money that matters to you and your bankroll for sports betting shouldn't should be just that it shouldn't cut into your mortgage payments it, it can't you can't let that you can't have that much pressure you're not going to handicap well under pressure those are some of them and don't bet the bets that are just bad Parlays without a reason to parlay teasers, you know, that moving 14 down to eight for the other six point teaser is just a mistake. And the logic of sports betting, I'm counting Matt's book again, will tell you what to do, but more importantly, will tell you what not to do. Yeah. Uh, Dink, I thank you so much for that advice. Hopefully, there's a lot of people that can benefit from this video and uh, will, it'll keep them on the straight path going forward to help make them a stronger sports better if they want to become one. And uh, if not, then uh, this might have been a good wake up call as to what's really necessary to become a better sports better. And uh, they may decide, you know, what, I'll, I'll just stick with my $50 on the early game, $50 on the late game. Um, but Dink, thank you so much for your time. This has been great. Uh, and uh, hopefully everyone has benefited from this as, as much as we have. Thank you. Could I, could I say one thing? Sure, uh, go ahead. If you like this video, I fundraise for a horse rescue. Okay, it's yes. At Southern California Thoroughbred Rescue, and the website is sctbrescue.org, and you can look and see what it is. It's a very legitimate organization, and uh, I think it's what I give back because I do love horse racing, too. I want to give back something to the horses. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Dink. Um, thank you. All right. Thank you. My and I'll, what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll splice that in so that it kind of just, it, it ends with you giving out that uh, address and I'll, I'll put the address up on the screen as well. Um, and we'll, you know, just kind of end it there. Um, so I, I think this went well. I mean, it's, we got about an hour's worth of tape here. Like I said, I want to get it down to 30 minutes. If by chance I can't, I'll just make it two episodes and find a way to put them together. Um, but we'll- Let me I'll show you one thing that you might want to do. This is, uh, it's always beneficial to have an assistant if you can afford it. Uh, she, she, this is Serena and she takes away from a lot of mundane responsibilities I have so I can keep staring at the gun that screen. You know, I've actually had some people volunteer and say, you know, can I help you out with this or that? Or, um, and I just haven't kind of come around to finding someone yet, but uh, I definitely so need to find to somebody. Give them some of your tasks that you don't like, even if they're non-gambling tasks. Well, those are the ones, yeah. Beneficial of giving yourself time. I'm sure they can help you with computer entries too. Serena helps me with some things like that. Yeah. Now, I, I, video editing is is my biggest headache because uh, you know it takes 
hours and hours of kind of going through it. So, um, but and in a way, I kind of enjoy it because that's something new to me and it's learning new skill. So it's also at the same time, it's although it takes hours, it's there's a satisfaction there. You know, often when I get done a video and I publish it up there, it's like a rush. It's like going eight no on a day. You know, it's cool. it feels really good. Um, so there, there's a little that's bit of a dopamine. Kind of, that's your, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, I'm sorry, you, you broke up there a little bit, Dink. <laughs>